Welcome to our service today. Uh, the Lord has provided one day of the week for, for worship. And this is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome all of you that are coming today. And we have some people back that haven't been here for a while, and we thank God for that. Uh, we do have a few announcements. One is uh, we have coffee hour or coffee time after the service in the back. And if you would like to, come and join us for that. Uh, Elise, I believe, donated the flowers today. In loving memory of my parents, Ted and Kathleen. In memory of her parents, good. And uh, I think uh, we have Norm's daughter is going to be taking mail. So if you have some mail that needs to be sent, Let's, uh, yes, Canada. Is anybody going to Canada? <laughs> let's, uh, let's get ready for prayer. And at this time, what we do is we ask God to, in, to bring his presence to our service. So let's pray together. Our gracious God, you are the Almighty God, the everlasting God who was and is and is to come. You are the God that loves us. You are the Holy God. You are Almighty. And we pray today as we begin our service that you might bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Let each of us be able to say when we leave that we've been in the presence of the Holy God. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us so richly. Thank you for giving us the gift of life. Thank you for those around us that love us, for our families, for this church family. God, we thank you that you give us daily the provisions that we need. You give us something to drink, to eat. Father, you watch over us and guard and guide us. You give us the direction and your Holy Spirit is available every moment of every day. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And now let's take a moment for silent prayer just to ask God to, be, to make us uh, ready for his word today and that we might be able to worship in spirit and in truth. Bow with me. Amen. Now call to worship as we are instructed in God's word. Let us now worship the Lord with gladness. <coughs> Let us come before his presence with singing as we praise his holy name. And now please stand and join me in worshiping God by singing together our first hymn, which is number 349. Sing ye first.
Good morning. Our responsive reading today is from Psalm 123. Please reply on the boldface print. I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant of contempt from the proud. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Ezekiel 2, 1 to 5. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious people. They will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be remain seated for the next song. Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these, uns these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, 
I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Gospel reading. Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? He asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. It's a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Bow with me now as we pray. Our Father, our Almighty God, as we come before you now, we lift up all the concerns that we have as a church. We pray for those Christians around the world, some which are being persecuted, and ask that you might watch over them, guard and guide them. Father, give each one of us that worships you and calls upon the name of Jesus a great time of worship together. God, we pray for those in our congregation that have special needs. They are those that are still sick. and We ask that you might restore them to health, especially remember Lynn Hansen. God, just strengthen her body and lift her up. We pray for others in our congregation that are sick and we pray for healing for them. Thank you, God, for those that have been sick and are now here with us today in our worship. And we pray a special measure of your grace upon their lives. Be with those, Father, that are lonely, those that do not have a home, for those that do not know you as Savior. And we pray that you might give us the voice, that we might speak the word of Christ wherever we go with everyone that we meet. And let it be known that we are Christians by the love that we have for one another. And Lord, we pray now together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Stand and sing our next hymn, The Potter's Hand. Thank you. 
may be seated. So we're continuing our sermon series in Philippians, and we began it two weeks ago, but really all we've gotten through is the, dear friends, hello, how are you? I love you, I miss you, I'm praying for you part. Now we get to the newsy bits. What's happening to Paul? And not just what's happening to Paul, but why it's happening, how he's responding to it. And what is happening? The gospel is advancing in surprising ways. And as Paul says, that's the important thing. You're going to remember that by the end of the sermon. What's the important thing? The gospel is advancing. So let's read together. Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. <coughs> The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I can rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So, the gospel. The gospel has advanced by Paul's imprisonment. That's what he's talking about when he says, I'm in chains, and the palace guard are, are all hearing this. He is in prison. It's become apparent to all who know Paul's situation that he's in prison, not because he's guilty of a crime, but on account of his stand for the gospel. And that includes the whole palace guard some of whom would have had personal contact with Paul or would have even been assigned to him individually to guard him if, when he was under house arrest. Those soldiers, in turn, would have told others about this really unusual prisoner and what he believed. Now, you know the story of Jacob's 12 sons. When they were young and all lived at home, Joseph was clearly Jacob's favorite. His brothers resented him. And Joseph was a little full of himself. He kept telling his brothers about the recurring dreams he had, that they would be bowing down to him. Obnoxious, right? Then Jacob gave Joseph a special, ornate robe. And worse, when jo Joseph was tending flocks with his brothers, he brought his father a bad report about the rest of them. Nice! Now, he was only 17, and all but one of his brothers were older than he, so you'd think they could cut him a little slack, but they did not. They really did not like him. And when he went out to the, into the fields to look for them one day, they decided to kill him. Wow. Fortunately, the oldest one, Reuben, talked them into throwing him into a cistern so that he could go back and rescue Joseph later. But while they sat there eating their lunch, they saw a caravan coming. And Judah, his next old, the next oldest of the tribe of the sons, said, let's sell him as a slave to this caravan. So they did. And the caravan took him all the way to Egypt. He was a slave for a while. He was imprisoned for even longer. But then he interpreted two dreams for Pharaoh and was released. Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph that he put him in charge of his whole palace and, in fact, the whole country. And this happened when Joseph was about 30 years old. So he'd spent 13 years either enslaved or in prison. When his brothers had to come to Egypt after seven more years had passed to buy grain during a famine, they had to buy it from Joseph. But Joseph wasn't interested in revenge. He wanted to know whether his brothers had changed. And he tested them. They didn't recognize him. He recognized them. And he learned that they had regretted what they'd done. 
They protected Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. And in fact, Judah, the one whose bright idea it was to sell Joseph, in, uh, yeah, Joseph into slavery, offered to trade his own freedom for Benjamin's. Self-sacrifice had not been Judah's way up until then. And at the very end of the story, he says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's in Genesis 50, verse 20. And this is the thing that Paul is saying here. He's in prison. And the people who got him arrested meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. The preaching of the gospel, the important thing. And that's why Paul is rejoicing. He says, I am in chains for Christ. Joseph said what he did in hindsight, though he'd probably clung to God in hope through the whole story. And Paul is saying this while his story is still going on. Now he, of course, knows of a much more recent story in which a Jewish man falsely accused by his own people suffered the extreme penalty of crucifixion at the hands of wicked people. And he still demonstrated through the resurrection that God meant it for good. With this story of Jesus echoing in his head and bringing into focus the Jewish belief that Israel's God would somehow, strangely, produce good out of evil, we shouldn't be surprised at Paul's powerful statement of his belief. But it's not just Paul who is advancing the gospel. The gospel is being proclaimed without fear. In verse 14, Paul says, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters here in Rome, is where he's talking about, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul's chains have given other believers confidence. Wouldn't that seem unexpected? Well, it would be without the Holy Spirit. Notice that Paul doesn't say they're confident in Paul. No, they're confident in the Lord. Christians in every generation have to take courageous stands for the gospel. In the 20th century, the confessing church in Germany stood against the so-called German Christians who had sold out to the evil policies of the Third Reich. Think how much the church of the 21st century is tempted to swim with the tide of society when the church ought to stand against it. When the church itself makes an idol out of political power or money or even something as pitiful as physical security, we are not demonstrating confidence in the Lord. Sometimes we need a Paul to demonstrate courage to us, to let us know that there are worse things than being in chains, and that the important thing is to preach the good news. Courage can be contagious, and Paul's example challenged other believers to be just as bold in proclaiming the gospel. His example demonstrated God's faithfulness to his persecuted children, and that their imprisonment would not halt the progress of the gospel, and that encouraged them to be bold and not live in fear. Think about it. If Paul had become depressed by his situation, the others too would have lost enthusiasm for the gospel, but exactly the opposite was true. They drew courage from Paul's example. They laid their fears aside and became even more bold in proclaiming God's word. The gospel is also preached from false motives and true. That's also a little odd to think about. Paul says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now these preachers aren't preaching bad things. Their doctrine is fine. Their message is true, even though their motives are not pure. 
The gospel has its objectivity and validity apart from those who preach it. Praise God. In fact, sincerity is no substitute for truth. You might hear people say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere about it. But no. In fact, Paul would prefer that people insincerely preach the truth. As long as God continues to use people, people, fallen people, to spread the gospel, every preacher you see will have, at best, mixed motives. Not all the time, I hope. They will be, unfortunately, better at saying what they mean than living it. They will be, sometimes in large ways, sometimes in small, hypocrites. Motives in preaching are not always noble. Paul says some preach Christ only from selfish ambition, having the right message, but the wrong motives. This is always a threat to the church. But Paul's response was generous. Christ is preached and preached, and that's what's important. And those troublemakers in the church, those who preached out of envy and rivalry, their selfish motives were no match for the sovereignty of Jesus. What does it matter? Paul, the one most impacted by these awful circumstances, says, you know what? I don't care. He releases it all to God. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of that, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Paul was under arrest. Some fellow Christians sought by their preaching to add to his difficulties. Yet, he keeps rejoicing. Paul makes me kind of tear up sometimes. He isn't perfect, but he is so pure. As children of a sovereign God, we are never victims of our circumstances. We are never victims of our circumstances. It can feel that way. Paul believed in the loving hand of a good and gracious God. He was protected by God's strength, preserved by God's love. He lived beneath the shadow of God's wings. It's painful to confess that most of us try to control our circumstances, control our situation, only to find that we fail again and again. Trusting that God means our troubles for good is difficult. Paul might have been forgiven if he had chosen <clears throat> excuse me, to take a little sabbatical as he sat in prison awaiting his trial. Yet he used every opportunity to advance the gospel. Paul was a leader who never drifted from his mission. The important thing. He was determined to leave Christ's mark wherever he went for the sake of the gospel. Amen. And now, a prayer of confession. As we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Father, through your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things, and we praise you for that. But we've also come before you now, confessing that where you are great and strong, we are weak and uncertain. We confess that we have failed to love you with our whole heart, soul, and mind. And we confess that we have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Too often, Lord, we have ignored your commandments, strayed from your way, and followed other gods and other priorities, no matter how shallow these priorities may have been. Our sins are large before us, Father, and we bring them now to you. Hear us and forgive us, we pray. Lord, as each of us, in the silence of our heart, confess to you our own sins. <clears throat> Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all of our sins. We do repent. Forgive us, please, and raise us to new life that we may serve you faithfully 
and give honor to your holy name. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. Dear friends, now hear the good news. We know that God does not see as we see. He is able to see into our hearts. And for that reason, we can be assured that as we have felt sorrow for our sins, confessed them to God and asked for his forgiveness, he is faithful in wiping away all those sins and giving us new life in him. You can rejoice that you are a forgiven people. Amen. And now about the, our celebration of communion. As we come to the time of communion, we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition, recognition of his great sacrifice for us. After the words of institution, ushers will release the rows one at a time, starting from the back, and to come down the center aisle. And once you have received the elements, go back down the sides to return to your seat. If you're unable to come forward, we will bring the elements to you immediately after the others have been served. As a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus, please eat the bread immediately as you receive it. As a sign that we also share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat with you and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we practice open, communica uh, <laughs> open communication to open communion, which means you do not have to be a member of this church or even a Presbyterian. All baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. But we must remember that while all baptized believers in Jesus are welcome to share in this Lord's table, it is not to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth after partaking in this communion, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the bread drinks the cup of the Lord is an, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Welcome to the Lord's table. Jesus gave the two elements of the Lord's Supper. One is the bread, that re represents his body which was broken for us. The other is the wine that represents his spilled blood that gives us forgiveness from our sins. Because this is the Lord's table, we welcome all to participate with us who have been baptized believers who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and have asked Him to forgive their sins and have repented of their sins. However, having said that, there is a caveat. And that is, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 not to partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily. I've thought about that. I think part of that means that we do not have unconfessed sin in our lives. That's why we have a time of confession for this. But the other is, if we have not forgiven someone for something that they have done against us, then we need to do that right now because we can't participate worthily as long as we have not forgiven someone. And so that's an important distinction. Uh, Paul said that some have died because they partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily, and we need to be very careful in this. So as we begin, let's consecrate the elements and also our own lives. Our Father, we do pray that you will consecrate these elements. Though they are ordinary elements, they represent Jesus who is perfect, pure, 
And we pray that as we partake, we will remember the great sacrifices that He made for each one of us. Thank You, O God, that He gave the supper as a memorial and also a sacrament offered to Him. This is indeed a preaching of the Gospel itself because it represents all that Christ died, did when He died on the cross and He shed His blood for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so the Bible says that uh, just before Jesus was taken, He gathered the disciples together and He said, This bread is the representative of my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And he broke it. And then he said afterwards, uh, the cup represents uh, his blood that was shed for us. And he said, do this uh, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Could we have our ushers to begin leading people forward?
Bow with me as we pray together. Our gracious God, as we have partaken of these elements, we remember you. Father, we remember the day that Christ came into our lives and offered us eternal life. We remember the great sacrifice that he made on the cross as he, his body was broken and his blood was poured out that we might have eternal life. God, we thank you so much for the great sacrifice that Jesus made. And as we are here together, we pray that our fellowship might be complete. And Lord, we anticipate that we shall continue to partake of the Lord's Supper until Jesus comes. In his precious name we pray. Amen. And now our thanksgiving through tithes and offerings. If we truly believe that God created the entire universe, then we also believed that all that we have or can ever have ultimately belongs to God. In that faith, we now have an opportunity to express our gratitude to God in very practical ways, by giving back to God and the wealth that he has entrusted to us. To help the church share with others the good news about Jesus. As the, um, as the ushers come forward, please be prayerful as you give and as generous as possible. Let us pray, Father in heaven, we profess and believe that you are the creator and that all that exists belongs to you. We also proclaim, Father, that your son, Jesus, the Christ, is our Lord and Savior. May our faith be strong and give us wisdom to see how we can help others also come to know you. Accept these, our gifts, and use them to your glory. For it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. the singing of the doxology and remain standing throughout the benediction. Tomorrow, our communications group is going to be meeting here at the church at 10 o'clock, and we invite others to come and participate. There's only one topic to be discussed. There's no secret that we uh, do not have about more than half of our congregation uh, since the pandemic. And we're going to be talking about some ways that we can actually grow back. And that's important because we have a mission from Christ in this community. And in order to be able to do that, we need the people to be with us, to help us and join us. So now I bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May He turn His face to you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance to you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may God's blessing be with you this next week. Amen. Refreshments and fellowship in the courtyard. Thank you.